Hi, I'm Dave Dugan. I'm the president of Eptron. This is a short course series we have, Ventilation for Acceptable Indoor Air Quality. This is going to be kind of an overview summary of what it is so that you know what we have inside these uh, presentations if you want to take a look at them in more detail. If you want to see the full length versions of these, this is about two thirds of our full length version that we do at what we call our Bring a Guest, then you want to find the uh, Bring a Guest uh, videos. Uh, in part one, we're going to talk about dilution ventilation and IAQ. In part two, we're going to talk about making the case for direct outdoor airflow measurement. When we get to part three, we're going to be talking about CO2 and particularly recognizing some of the pitfalls of CO2 ventilation control. In part four, we're going to talk about how to improve demand control ventilation, uh, including CO2 DCV also take a look at population-based DCV. In part five, we're going to do a very brief version of building pressurization for acceptable indoor air quality. In part six, we're going to integrate outdoor air with building pressure control. Uh, again, this is going to be another one of these uh, presentations where if you want to get more detail, and particularly into the actual sequences, then you want to look at the actual brain guest videos. In part seven, making buildings safer during and after COVID-19. I think that's really something that we should all understand. And finally, in part eight, we're going to talk about our measurements, the measurement solutions that we have, but um, not any super details. So let's go a little further here. Uh, part one, just a quick overview, dilution ventilation and IQ. We're going to talk about how indoor air quality affects uh, occupant well-being, risk management, management and facility operations. We're going to take a, a brief look at understanding the contaminants of concern, uh, particularly now that we have to deal with airborne pathogens. We're going, to, we're going to take a look at what you have to do to maintain contaminants below threshold levels, and it's really going to be a combination of dilution ventilation or outdoor air and some high-level uh, filtration. Uh, we're going to also take a look at the uh, standards and codes that we have to deal with now in uh, commercial buildings. Uh, particularly uh, ASHRAE Standard 62 and, uh, and the International Mechanical Code. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, Standard 90.1 a bit and how some of our energy uh, concerns about energy are really in conflict with what we're trying to do for ventilation. Um, we're going to date me a little bit. We're going to go back and talk about a paper that we uh, published 30 years ago, but it's still a very important paper. Uh, on measurement for the control of fresh air intake that discusses some of the problems that we have to overcome when we decide to, uh, to, to, to really be concerned with dilution ventilation. And I think that you're going to find that a lot of the problems we have today uh, really come to light in, uh, in this uh, analysis, uh, particularly when we take a look at the overall system. And we'll go into a lot of detail about this um, system induced, damper induced, and environmental induced uh, factors that influence outdoor airflow rates. Um, we're going to show you that uncontrolled outdoor air intake flow rates, which is the bulk of what we have right now, has a tremendous uncertainty of at least you know 50% of set point, and in many cases even more than that. Um, hopefully, we get the logical conclusion to everybody that you know you just it's not just measure outdoor air uh, flow rates, but it's actually control them, and it's on all systems, right? And, and hopefully, we make that point pretty clear. In part two, though, part one really says, hey, we have to do something to measure uh, and control, but not specifically direct measurement of, of outdoor air intake flow rate. So that's what we're going to do in part two. We're going to look at these, um, you know, the direct, why is it better? We're going to basically, we're going to compare all the different methods uh, in, in, in some bit of detail so that you can understand that direct airflow measurement is really what you need to do. Um, we're going to look at the types of measurement technologies you can uh, use, and so you can see that thermal is really where we need to be on outdoor air intakes. When we get into part three, we're, we're hopefully going to really um, shed some light onto some of the, the misconceptions associated with CO2, which are really disturbing, actually, um, at this point. And um, so I call it recognizing the pitfalls of CO2 ventilation control. We're going to talk a little bit about how energy has really been in conflict uh, with, uh, with uh, healthy buildings. And um, we're going to go back and take a look at how, you know, these factors is there really is this conflict between energy consumption and occupant well-being. Uh, we're going to take a brief look at some of the costs and um, how much we're, we're focusing on energy and really a, a ignoring the uh, occupant when, when 
really, to, from an owner's perspective, is the occupants where the payback is. And uh, we're going to try to explain to you the relationship between CO2 and ventilation. It's not a contaminant. That's not why we're measuring it. So we want you to understand why you're doing that. We want to look at the relationship between uh, outdoor air and CO2, and you'll find that they're codependent, and that means quite a bit as well. Um, but basically lowering the CO2 level generally does result in increased outdoor air, but there's a lot of uncertainties associated with it. And we start to look at, first of all, does it even meet the requirements of the ventilation standards, and how do these uncertainties affect uh, basically you know, how much outdoor air you're actually bringing in, and what can we do there? And, and then, and then the whole problem that even with CO2, once you understand the relationship between CO2 and ventilation, you realize that it's dependent on the CO2 production rates, which is very age dependent too. Uh, so we're going we're to talk about that and we're going to show you how some of these uh, schools where you think it's safe today are, are, uh, are, are really under ventilating uh, by doing CO2 ventilation control. Uh, we're going to talk about activity level and how activity level has to be taken into consideration. Uh, one of the big problems is lag, so we're going to show you, how, again, how uh, low CO2 levels don't necessarily mean you have proper ventilation, um, and it's, it's really actually quite a big problem. Um, when we get to part four, though, we're going to say, look, we have to do demand control ventilation really does make sense on a lot of spaces, particularly high occupant density uh, with, uh, spaces with extreme uh, population variability, okay? And so we want to go through how do we improve it, and we're going to talk about occupant counting, give you a strategy for occupant counting, uh, basically show you some of the uncertainties there, uh, the fact that there's no lag error. Um, those of you that have to use CO2, we're going to improve CO2 DCV. We're going to talk about accounting for the activity level and age, and then uh, setting limits and not setting limits with, uh, with dampers because there's so much variability with dampers, but setting limits with airflow measurement. We're gonna go into the strategy that we suggest uh, on a, for controlling an improved single point, uh, set point DCV uh, using a CO2 sensor. We're gonna show you the results and the associated uncertainties with that. Uh, we're even gonna go into an improved CO2 method that really better meets the requirements of standard 62, uh, where we actually use airflow measurement CO2 sensing to actually estimate the actual population of the space. That's pretty interesting. Show you the errors associated with that. Um, we're going we're gonna to go into looking at some of the real big myths that there are right now. People are making some fairly large mistakes. They're putting in uh, uh, filtration systems or air cleaning systems, and they're still operating uh, under uh, trying to do some type of CO2 DCV. So we're going to we're going to show you some of the problems associated with that, how uh, operating under, say, something called the IQ procedure in standard 62, if you lower the ventilation rate, you ultimately increase the CO2 levels. But if you're trying to control CO2, then you end up having to bump up the, uh, the uh, ventilation rate. So that's, that's a pretty interesting one. And then we show you some of the other misconceptions associated with uh, filtration or air cleaning systems that actually remove CO2 and why that's a problem that usually results in underventilation. In part five, building pressurization for acceptable IQ, it's quick. It's not very detailed, uh, but it's something that we're just going to discuss. We're going to talk about why uh, basically negatively pressurized buildings are a problem from an indoor air quality perspective. We're going to talk about cooling, we're going to talk about free cooling, and we're going to talk about heating periods and why that is. Um, when we look at building pressure, it's not really pressurizing a building at all. So we're going to introduce to you, if you're not already aware of it, something called the pressurization flow, and it's the things that we need to really be concerned with, and how you actually create positive pressurization in the building. Um, when we get into part six, we're going to again go into uh, we're going to go into integrating outdoor air and building pressure control, but. Because of the time constraints on these short courses, we're not going to really do as much detail as we would like to do on the actual sequences. If you want to see more of that, you want to go to the full bring guest presentation. But we're going to talk about the airflow control points that we need to be concerned with. We're going to look at uh, recirculating air handling systems and take about, talk about where you need to measure. Um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about strategies that you shouldn't do as well as strategies that you should. Um, and then uh, basically we're going we're gonna to move on from there into dedicated outdoor air. Again, we're going to 
look at some of the measurement points we should be considering and uh, then how to do the control. When we get into part seven, part seven is make buildings safer during and after COVID-19. I think this is very important. We're going to reference the ASHRAE positions document on infectious aerosols. Uh, we're going to look at the effect of humidity and desiccation and, and, and what, how your HVAC system actually transports these viruses. And, um, you know, hopefully this is an eye opener to some of you that are not aware of this because this is really the problem with our ventilation systems and or, or something we have to at least, this is why we have to do something. Um, we're going to talk about it how COVID actually can, or, or similar air, or airborne pathogens can actually build up in the space. And again, at the ultimate solution, just like we did really on part one in general for IQ is a combination of dilution ventilation and high level filtration. Uh, we're gonna talk about how traditional thinking may not work. Uh, we've never had to operate and design under a pandemic before. I think that we need to take a look at what we're doing, not only in the ventilation standard 62.1 for uh, that's normally the one that we do, but I think we also need to take a look at our healthcare ventilation facility, uh, our healthcare ventilation um, standards, or what, it, what what those standards actually say. It really is quite a bit different. I think it's worth it's worth uh, reviewing. Uh, we're going to have some uh, basic uh, recommendations. The one thing that I like to do is say, hey, we have a normal mode, and we have a pandemic. Okay, and so we should design our systems so they can easily switch between these two modes. And um, we're gonna describe how, how we suggest that you do that. Um, we're gonna talk about bringing in more ventilation if, when possible during pandemic mode. And then uh, we're just gonna finish off with, uh, with our product solutions. And, and we're basically you know, gonna talk about who we are and what we are. And uh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, Eptron's been around since 1983. I've been there since 1984. Uh, a lot of my staff, and, and, and which are now good friends of mine, really do understand what we're doing. And so we're going to go through how our products work and then our product solutions. All right, so that is our, um, that is our brief overview. So thank you very much.